Lord, thank you for today. Thank you again for what you've done and what you're doing. And we thank you in advance, even as we look at the ending of this year and the beginning of a new year, we look forward with anticipation of what you're going to do in the coming year. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so, you know, uh, if, like I mentioned, it's Christmas Eve, you may have missed it with everyone being sick and all, but yeah, it's Christmas Eve. And we are finally at the very heart of the season where we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ was born. Born so long ago in the town of Bethlehem to a young couple from Nazareth. And yes, these days we celebrate and we worship Jesus Christ in commemoration of his birth. Because we're not given the exact date of his birth. And it's probably a good thing. Because look at what we tend to do with stuff that we do know. We put things uh, as icons. And if we knew the exact date, just think of what would happen. I think God was preserving us from ourselves. But regardless, this is the time of year that we commemorate and that we celebrate the fact that Jesus did come. And you know, we, we, we sang a couple of Christmas carols today. You know, songs that we don't normally sing through the year. And we tend to hear a lot of Christmas carols, even in stores as we're shopping now. <coughs> and all over the place, we hear all kinds of Christmas carols. Songs that give us the, the imagery of the scenes of that first Christmas is what a Christmas carol really is. Songs that seem to be able to set the atmosphere for us. Images of the crowded inn, the smelly stable, the sleeping city. The great star shining its beauty down over the waiting earth. We sing about the lonely shepherds in the field. The blazing sudden glory of the heavenly host breaking through the darkness. And the contrast of the stable where Christ was born. Songs that speak of the sleeping baby and the wondering hearts that come to worship and kneel before this amazing wonder that Jesus Christ was born on earth. You know, one carol we sing at Christmas asks the question, what child is this? It says, what child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch or keeping? And the chorus of that Christmas carol answers. It says this, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of Mary. And I'm sure that the shepherds, though, even though they had been told by the angels that the one they went to see was the Savior, Christ the Lord, that they still asked the same question when they went into the stable on that first Christmas day. What child is this? Who is this that the angels sing about? No one truly had an adequate answer at the time. Mary, we are told in Luke 2.19, as she watched all these things, as she heard all these things, as she witnessed all these things, we're told that she kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. That means she was wondering about them. She didn't have an answer for it all. She was pondering what it all could mean. What had come to pass? But in reality, even she did not know fully what the answer was. I'm sure she could not, in the slightest nether regions of her imagination, have any inkling of who this really was that she held in her arms that night. Like the question posed by another one of our Christmas songs, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. And all the angel did tell Mary about regarding Jesus, who he is, who he would be. You know, she knew some of this. She could imagine as much as her finite mind would allow. But even she could not answer that question fully. Who is this child? 
The answer to that question couldn't be given until we got the full record unfolded in the gospel account. Where in those accounts we see the aftermath of the birth with the slaughter of the innocents, the flight to Egypt, followed by silent years in Nazareth and the coming of age of Jesus. We see him baptized by John, followed by the temptation in the wilderness. And we witness the call of his disciples and we see him trudging up and down the hills of Galilee and Judea. With, along with the disciples and with many people that followed him everywhere he went. And we read the teaching. We read the miracles. And finally, we see the last frantic, dramatic week in Jerusalem that culminated with a sham of a trial, his brutal beating, his walk to Calvary, and the cross, all culminating in the blazing glory of the resurrection and his ascension. And even then, it still wasn't over. There was the moment in Jerusalem when the Spirit was poured out upon the waiting disciples. The whole city was gathered to hear the great sound of a rushing wind in the wonder of Pentecost. It's only then that you begin to get a full answer to the question, what is this child? What child is this? Who is this child? That's what we're going to ponder today on this Christmas Eve morning and look on in wonder at just who was born that Christmas long ago? You can turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to look at the opening words of the epistle to the Hebrews. We studied it before. But in that passage, we see one of the best answers in the scriptures about the question that's on the lips of those who came that night of the birth. What child is this? For in Hebrews chapter 1, Verses 1 through 4, the writer describes just who Jesus is. He begins with this. He says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now clearly, <clears throat> the central declaration of that passage is the twice-repeated thought that God spoke to man. He said God spoke to man in times past. He spoke by the prophets. But now the writer says he has spoken to us by his son. And that tells us that the answer to the question, what child is this, is that this baby lying in Mary's lap in Bethlehem is the ultimate, the complete word of God to mankind. We never again will have God speaking like this to man after this birth at Bethlehem in the account of the life of Jesus. God has revealed all we need to see, all we need to hear. And it's only up to us to hear and to heed what he has said. And that's why for all of these centuries after, we have never had another event like this. For God has spoken to us in his son and his son declared that it's finished. He has revealed the mystery of creation, the purpose of it all through Jesus Christ. You know, John begins his gospel on the same note that rings out in Hebrews. In John, he starts his gospel at the very beginning of it saying this in John verse one or chapter 1, verse 1. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. And he goes on just a few verses later to say, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, in the passage in Hebrews, the writer surrounds this statement that he made that Jesus is the word of God with certain phrases that give five great reasons why the child of Bethlehem is God's final word to mankind. The first one is in the very first sentence. In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, he said, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. When you open up the Old Testament, you're reading the word of God spoken to the fathers by the prophets. And it's a fascinating version. 
It's an amazing introduction and revelation as to who God is and what he did. What an amazing testimony we have in the Old Testament. What a marvelous book it totals. How many different ways God spoke throughout it in dreams, in visions, in sudden appearances. And that wonderful act of inspiration that truly nobody fully understands. <clears throat> Where somebody speaking the words that come to their mind and heart is actually uttering the words of God. Where God speaks through mankind to mankind. And it comes to us in many different forms, as the writer of Hebrews says. You open Genesis, and you have the first, the very, the, the very first, you have the very straightforward but majestic and moving account of creation, of the fall of mankind, and of the flood. And it's followed by the simple narrative of the lives of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the recounting of the life of Moses in the Exodus comes next. And the thunderings of the law. And then we have the history of the Jewish nation. Coming at last to the sweet singing of the psalmist, the unmatched wisdom of Proverbs, and the delicate tenderness of the Song of Solomon. And then the rest of the Old Testament is filled with the exalted visions of the prophets, these mighty men who spoke in times of crisis to their nation, and yet lifted their eyes up and saw far beyond the horizons of time to great events that God was going to bring into being when the right season rolled around. Still, when you finish all of those books, when you finish the complete narrative of the Old Testament, and you've heard all the matchless oratory of the prophets, you still realize that God's voice has not answered the deep questions of the human's heart. Jesus spoke to that fact in Matthew 13, 17, where he said that the prophets longed to see what the people of his day did see. They long to fully understand the various utterances they have been given. It's only when you open the Gospels and begin to read of Jesus, who he is, what he did, where he went, what he said, how he acted, how he lived, the way he handled each and every situation. It's only then that finally all the utterance of the prophets begin to merge into one great voice and we get God's final word to mankind. You know, there's a reason I love the Sermon of the Mount so much. I think it's the greatest message we've ever had the privilege to hear. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. It's a marvelously condensed and purified statement of all that God wants man to know about life. Telling us God's intent for all of it. The heart behind the law. The real reason it exists. That all of it in reality pointed to the need for the coming of the Son of Man. For the coming of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament all flows together to form one great voice that speaks with clarity in the New Testament. All these various themes that God introduces to mankind in the Old Testament are brought together in the voice of Jesus. He is God's final word to mankind, greater than the prophets, fulfilling everything that they've written. <coughs> and secondly, the writer of Hebrews next points out that it's a greater word because Jesus forms, he says, the boundaries of history. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, he says, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Now there's the beginning of the past. He made the worlds. And there's the end of the future because he's the heir of all things. And when the writer says that he is looking on, when the writer says that he is looking on to the end of time, and every now and then someone says to me, where is all this going to end? Where are, are, are we in the last days? Is this the time that's going to happen? Is this the time when God's going to bring human history to a jolting, crashing end? And the answer, of course, is yes. Well, maybe. As soon is relative in our timing. But the coming end, I believe, will be soon. Could be in my lifetime, and I think will be in my lifetime. Because I think prophetically things line up for Christ to come again. If you want to know what that looks like, read what Jesus said. Read Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and Mark 13. See what Jesus said about the times that we live in. 
There you have the words of the Son of God himself as to what's going to happen and why in reality could be any time and any moment. We are to be looking up, anticipating his soon return. It will all end, he says, when the Son of Man returns in his glory. And the final end will be when he establishes his kingdom upon the earth and after that time. He's awaiting us there at the end of time. He is the heir of all things. But he's not only the end of the future, but he's also the beginning of the past. Because when you look backwards to the very creation, there you find Jesus Christ. The most wonderful thing that Christmas sets before us is this almost unbelievable statement that the baby who lies in Mary's arms in a smelly cave in Bethlehem is the one who created the entire universe. You know, in our night sky... We can only catch an inkling of the scope and the size of all things. With telescopes, we can see further. We can see more of it. And with the pictures we receive from the space station and with our telescopes in space, we can see even more. But the thing that is most amazing of all is to remember that all the vast universe, with its teeming millions of galaxies, you know, it takes hundreds of thousands of light years to cross even one of them. But it was brought into being by the word of the one who lied in as a babe at Mary's breast in Bethlehem. That's the universal statement, the testimony of Scripture. By prediction in the Old Testament, by statement in the Gospels, and by the declaration of the apostles afterward. The whole of testimony we are, we are given speaks to that fact. And Christianity is built on the foundation of this truth. That the one who lay there in Bethlehem was the creator of the world. He brackets all of time. Jesus stands at the end of every path upon which every creature and every human being who ever lived travels. Now not only that, but thirdly, the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the complete word of God because he's the master of the present as well. He puts it this way in Hebrews 1 verse 3 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, if you really think about that last statement, upholding all things by the word of his power, you're going to see that's a really amazing statement. It puts, the, it puts it in the present tense, saying that he is the one who keeps things going right now. When I was in my corporate days in manufacturing and had a manufacturing company in engineering and dealing with metallurgy and chemistry, I was able to take part in working with the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories and the Stanford Linear Accelerator on many projects, helping do work and modification and repairs at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories on the Shiva and Nova laser systems. Now, these are laser systems in huge rooms that the, the rooms themselves are larger than football fields in size, all with multiple uh, beams, lasers, that all target and converge on one minute singular point. Shiva was the world's most powerful laser when it was made. And when we completed Nova, it was ten times more powerful than that. It produced 100 trillion watts of infrared laser power for a billionth of a second. Its peak power produced 1,300 times the entire electrical generating capacity of the entire United States. And they were studying the fusion process of our sun and other stars, seeing how elements react how the energy compressed and released, turning atoms into other elements and discovering the makeup of our universe. It was amazing stuff. It was really fun to get to work on. But there, there could, it was amazing things that continually found more the deeper that people looked. They were finding secrets that we never knew existed. They were discovering a complexity in creation that they never dreamed of. <coughs> and they're finding particles that they haven't even named yet. But one thing they are consistently discovering is that there is some strange force that holds everything together that they can't quantify. They don't know what to call it. They don't know how to identify it. They talk about a kind of cosmic glue that holds things together. Now, isn't it fascinating that here in the Word of God, you have that exact kind of terminology used for Jesus of Nazareth. 
He's the one that holds all things together. If you want a, a name for the force that holds the universe together, it's very simple. His name is Jesus. And we're told very clearly that he sustains the universe by the power of his word. Or as it says in Colossians 1.17, in him all things consist. That's not only true of the physical universe, including our bodies and all that we are, but it's true of all the other forces and powers in the universe, physical, psychological, social, spiritual, whatever. Jesus Christ holds it all in his hands and holds it all together. After the resurrection, when our Lord appeared to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee, the most forthright term, simply and artlessly, Matthew records what he said to them. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus Christ has all authority, which means he not only controls all the physical forces of the planet and the universe, but he controls all the events that occur upon them. This is something Christians tend to forget. We get so used to seeing things through the secular eyes of the media and other propaganda forces around us that we forget that behind the events that fill the pages of our newspapers is a mighty controlling hand that's blending them all together, permitting some things to happen, restraining other things. The Bible tells us a mighty hand is shaping the destiny of nations and of individuals, of kings and leaders of the world. All these things have been in, power, in the power of him who sustains the universe by the power of his word. Then fourthly, the writer takes us even deeper, not only to these physical matters, these external visible things, but he takes us back now to the very depths of the human dilemma, the problem of human evil. And he says in the second half of chapter 1, verse 3 of Hebrews, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the final and complete word of God to man because he has solved the deepest problem of the human life. The problem of the evil of the human heart. The problem of human sinfulness. Everybody today is asking in the face of some of the tragic things that happen around us, what's wrong with humanity? What's wrong with life? Why is the world in a continual mess? Why are our papers filled with murder and violence and hate and corruption and darkness? Why all this murder and violence and evil? The answer of Scripture universally is man's sin. It's the heart of mankind. Or to put, even more, to put it even more realistically and more helpfully to us, it's man's selfishness. Men thinking of self. That's what lies at the root of it all. The terrible taint that all of us possess that we can ever wash away by our own efforts. The amazing declaration of Scripture is that the reason the creator of the world became the baby in Bethlehem was that he might make purification for human selfishness. That he might solve the unsolvable problem. That he would wash away the unwashable stain. And the good news of Christmas, of course, is that every one of us who has found Christ, who's come to him, who follow him, find again and again and repeatedly over and over that he continually has the power to cleanse us. He has the power to put away the guilt of the past, whether it's the past 50 years of life or the past five minutes of time. He has the power to cleanse it and wash it away and to set us on our feet again with a clean slate and a fresh page to write on every day, to live life again in the power and the grace of the living God. Now that's the greatest message of all. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high sat down because the work was done. He completed it. When he had made purification for our sins, and what agony and what terrible hurt that was involved in that phrase. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high because all the work was done. Jesus is Lord. This was the early creed of the church and it's the creed of all who come to know him now. He has solved that desperate problem of human life. He is in control and in charge of all human events. He's the writer of Hebrews says the final reason why Jesus is God's last word to man is that he has won the right 
to the worship of all creation. In verse 4, he said, Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, we, we tend to associate angels with Christmas. We read a lot about them in the gospel accounts of the birth of Christ. The angel chorus sang the praises of the baby to the shepherds on that wonderful night when the heavens were opened. But they are also the ones who gather around the throne of the Lamb in the book of Revelation and give praise and glory to Him. I want to read that account now, that we might have it before us. That account <coughs> that John gave us in Revelation 5, verse 6 through 14, when he saw the heavens open and he got to witness the majesty of the throne room of God. And this is what John said. In chapter 5 of Revelation, verse 6, he says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lord each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. That's one of the closing scenes that we have in our Bible. It's one of the great, the one great event toward which the whole of creation moves. All the events that crowd the news pages are worked out in some strange way more mysterious than we could imagine. The end that is described there. Therefore, Christmas means to us the most momentous event the ages have ever seen. Because it is the account of when the Lord of glory, the God that is worshipped in heaven, became the babe of Bethlehem in order that we might be delivered from our own selfishness and sin. That God himself stepped into creation as a helpless baby so that all mankind could be redeemed through his life, his sacrificial death, and his glorious resurrection. That's what Christmas is all about. We celebrate a birth, but the whole point of the birth was the cross. And the whole point of the cross was the aftermath, the resurrection, the ascension, and the glory that all results in relationship. That's what Christmas is all about. It's the opportunity for love to build and break out in our families, in our homes, among our friends, wherever we are, that the back of evil might be broken in our individual lives and we can be set free to be the loving creations God made mankind to be. That's why Christmas is always associated with warmth and love and joy and forgiveness and healing and beauty and light and glory. And now, now as we close our service, oh, may the gratitude of your hearts express within you the words to respond accordingly to God for what it means to you to have the Son of God born in your heart as he was born so long ago in that stable in Bethlehem. I read these words. It said, Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, until he's born within your heart, your life is still forlorn. Did you catch that? Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, if there was a thousand Christmases, 
None of that would matter unless Christ was born in your heart. Because that's what he came to do. That's truly the case. We could celebrate 10,000 times 10,000s 10, and thousands of thousands of Christmases. We could celebrate the fact that Christ came and was born here on earth. But until that truth is born in your heart, until submission to the purpose behind all of it is there, until there's submission to Christ, the acceptance of the sacrifice, the repentance of your sin, until that's done in your heart, then the celebration of the child that was born in Bethlehem is not fulfilled. For the purpose of all of it was you. The purpose of all of it was relationship with you. And if that is what you believe in your heart, that if you confess that Jesus is Lord with your mouth, if you believe that he's risen from the dead in your heart, then the fulfillment of Christmas has truly come. Because that's what it's all about. Relationship with him. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word and that through your word we do have everything we need to know how to have a relationship with you. How to belong to you. Oh Lord, be glorified in our lives. May we come to understand the depth, the width, the breadth, the height of your love for us. May we truly begin to act as Christians should. Being able to share all of that with other people. Thank you for what we celebrate this time of year. Thank you that in you and with you we have relationship with the living God. How glorious you are. I pray that you would not got, get lost in the shuffle of the busyness of the next few days. But our minds would continually be grateful celebrating the fact that you came in the fullness of what that means. Be glorified in our lives, O Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.